The Philippine literature, this is, I think, one of the first comprehensive study of that Sago plant from the natural science point of view. They encourage us from the other uh, colleges, colleges of social sciences and humanities, and from colleges of uh, school of management, I mean, there are only three colleges in uh, UP Mindanao, to also pursue studies along our lines of discipline to look at the different dimensions of Sago from our perspective. So what happened is, uh, from the anthropological uh, side, we made a study of Sago as, uh, as a forest wherein the Agusan Manobos, an indigenous people of uh, northern part of Mindanao, are actively uh, interacting for, the, for several generations. Uh, they have been using that Sago forest for many aspects of their uh, livelihood. So basically, it's first and foremost an ethnographic study, uh, a description. But uh, as we went along our study, we made some uh, interesting discoveries that uh, I want to uh, share to you this moment. <clears throat> Can I have the... Okay, so <clears throat> because this is a two-year project by our uh, department, there are so many individuals that participated in making a uh, study. And uh, I reflect there only the names of the specific individuals. They are actually my students who are more focused on this specific topic that I want to discuss to you at present. But in general, in overall, the whole objective is to produce a monograph of the same uh, level as that uh, delivered to us by the natural sciences. So we, the, the, the objective is to come up with a comprehensive study of Sago from a social science perspective, touching both on large themes like governance of this ancestral domain, the economics of Sago, the socio-ecological dimension of the Sago forest from the perspective of the users, to very small themes like the small tools, the techniques, the ways of doings, the designs of traditional equipment, and even to very small things that how do people walk within that forest? How do they orient and navigate through that forest? Okay, so as I have said, it's part of an ongoing research <coughs> uh, participated by uh, different uh, individuals focused on the Agusan Mars region. We want to understand the practices and patterns of this enduring Agusan Manobo and Sago Forest interaction in its broad socio-political and ecological context. In this presentation, we want to focus on the spatial and technological aspects of this human-forest relation. Spatial, meaning the folk mapping. How do folks uh, map the space? And uh, technological, the tools, in the palm starts processing. Okay, okay so you can read that the, the method after it's basically ethnographic. We stayed for several weeks and months in at least two villages. We plan to cover at least three villages from three different municipalities and uh, make a comprehensive study of the practices and uh, compare the <coughs> practices vis a vis the broader practices within Southeast Asia. Okay, so because I want to share to you only two things, how people map the Sago area from their perspective and what are the tools that they're using. So basically, what we did is, first of all, to get a sense of the place. This is a picture of a, a portion of that map made by US Army in the 1950s. And we plotted into this map the sub-areas of the Sago using uh, the GPS. So the names Pio, Ibai, Kabakungan, Okay, so 
okay, that one, Pio, Ibay, Kabakungan, Suna. These are sub-areas within the Sago Forest. This is the whole Sago Forest of that area. It's a specific municipality in uh, Bunawan. A specific uh, barangay in Bunawan. Uh, so after having that, because we will be using this as a comparison when we ask our informants about how they make sense of the place. So what we did is to get a picture of how people map that area. Can we go to that? <coughs> so I'm showing you two very important, from our perspective, this very, very precious uh, data. These are two ways of mapping the Sago Forest from the perspective of the Manobos. Uh, this came from the very knowledgeable informants, uh, two Manobos who are regular users of the Sago Forest. To us, it pictures, it gives us a picture of how they cognitively view the place. They don't normally map, of course. No? They don't make a two-dimensional mapping. They actually go directly to the forest and engage with the forest. But when we ask them, uh, can you map for us? Because they are, of course, literally, can you make a picture for us about the place so that we can have a sense of it? This is what they give us. This is a picture of the 900 hectare Sago Forest. What is interesting is, these are the pictures that I want to highlight. One thing that you can uh, uh, notice in the map is that they are actually linked with uh, lines. They suggest specific roads, networks within that thick swampy forest of hundreds and thousands of sago pumps. The second one, which is very interesting and not actually reported ethnographically, I think this is the first that we should highlight this as an ethnographic fact, at least in the, in the Mindanao level, is that the Sago Forest is not actually, as perceived by the Agusan, Agusanon Manobos, they do not actually look at it as a continuous a space of uh, lines and lines of uh, Sago Pams. They have, in their own uh, <clears throat> language, there are islands of sago clusters, and each sago cluster has a name. So th there is a name called Tapiso, uh, Lingkad, uh, Kibagyo, Kibuyo, etc., etc. And they are associated with specific stories, uh, notions about the original owner of that clump, and many other things. Maybe I'll read from my. Okay, sub areas are named based on plant or geographic characteristics, folkloric story, or the historic owner of that place. <clears throat> the second thing that you notice is that the sub areas are linked by pathways and they help them in navigating that space. They do not randomly go into the forest and cut the sago. The, the Sago forest actually from their perspective is structured well like there is an outer portion this one there is an inner portion this one and there is an innermost portion which they do not go directly and the other more interesting thing is that the logic of people who are doing Sweden farming appears to be the same as the logic of these people doing sago extraction inside the sago forest. There are indicators that they engage in. If you call the Sweden farming as rotational farming, I think you can call the method that they are doing as rotational extraction. Because specifically in this area, these two, these two maps actually have exactly the same presentation, although they look from our perspective differently, if you fully analyze the maps, you will notice that they are actually the same. The, the places that are located in the inner portion, like this one, they have the same names. In the middle portion, they have the same names, and then the outer portion, they have the same names, more or less. Uh, here, in the middle portion, here is where the rotational extraction happens. 
Actually, if you think about it, it's logical because if you go inside the forest, usually you 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 enter the forest by twos or by fours, like husband and wife or with your son and another friend. Now, the next time, if you want again to get to to, to cut a sago uh, trunk to extract the starch, it's better if once you have marked a certain area to be uh, a place where you can get good starts, then it's better if you go back again to that site because there are big prob there's a big probability that you can get the same kind of of tree or starts quality. So they concentrate on a certain area. Once that area is already uh, extracted of the the of the trunks, uh, you move to the next. You know, and then after a while, after several years, because sago takes seven years to uh, become mature, to be able to be extracted with good starts, then you go back to that area again. So that is what rotational extraction is about. Why is it that the outer portion are not used for that? The outer, extra, uh, the outer portion actually is used for uh, roof touching. They make use of the leaves because it's like a a coconut plant. Once you make use of the sago plant for roof touching, they do not anymore bear uh, good quality starts inside their trunk. So they are actually assign, uh, assigned for a different use. So they make use of this portion in the inner uh, part of the forest. <coughs> so I will read this portion here because maybe you can see. There is an inner and outer forest structure. One, two, three. There are indications of the practice of cyclic extraction comparable to Swedener's rotational farming. And this seems to occur in the mid area of the forest. What we're planning to do is to look again into the into this pattern in the two other sites. And so far, we are still uh, finished with the second site. Uh, more or less, they are practicing the same in another village. So I can say at this present that more or less this is an ethnographic fact, these three uh, features of the Sago Forest that I have noticed. <coughs> now, if you closely look into the specifics of the names, you can again see interesting things you know, that can uh, suggest some uh, logic in logic in the way people think about the space. Uh, look at this P.O. Ibai Kabakungan. These are some areas. P.O. Ibai Kabakungan. Uh, Kinawa. Where is Kabakungan? It's in the side of Ibai. But here it should be straight. This is the GPS uh, reading. So you might ask, why is it that in the actual mapping, th these are three straight lines, but in the mapping of the mind, in the mind of the Sago user, Kabakungan is actually beside Ibai. <clears throat> More or less, you can see the difference between mapping and wayfinding. If you say A, B, C, and this zona is D, A, B, C appears here, but C is actually in front of B. That actually, if you look at the logic of the user, if you take note, notice of the lines in the drawing, they actually they suggest the habitual lines that they are approaching or doing when they enter the forest. Once they enter the forest by Pio, they usually turn right. They usually turn right here to Pibagio. So they don't usually go into the direction of this Kabakungan. If you are at Ibai and you always turn right, actually Kabakungan becomes phenomenologically at your back. So that is the reason why when they plot this wayfinding way of mapping, they put Kabakungan at the back of the pipe. So each of these specific details that differ from the actual mapping in the GPS, there's actually a logic why they are they appear different. These are the sub-area names of uh, the different uh, informants. 
In another, in another setting, in a different area, they have the same names. More or less, they have in the same uh, area around 900 to 1,000. They have around 21 names or 25 names. Can you just? Uh, this is the equipment that they are using when they extract the starch. Okay. These are the different uh, steps how to extract the starch from the sagotra. Next. <clears throat> this is a map of the two ways of extracting starch across Southeast Asia. One is hand pressing, the other one is by trampling. If you put Mindanao into that map, it differs in so many senses. No? Uh, I cannot explain to you elaborately because of time limits, so I can just uh, show the next slide. <clears throat> this is the picture of the apparatus that they use to extract starch by trampling. Next. The same, this is the trampling method. These are the things that they're using. Next. <clears throat> The same, this is trampling method. Next. Okay, this is hand pressing method. Uh, this is the, the design of the equipment that they are using in order to extract the sagot stars. These are non Mindanawan uh, examples Indonesian and Papua New Guinea. Next. <clears throat> if you analyze the different methods, trampling, hand pressing, and kneading, which is the one used in Mindanao's setting, in Mindanao, the equipment is actually very, very simple. No? You can see the simplicity by looking at the uh, ratio between functional units and the structural elements. No? It's so close to uh, 0.5 and this one, 0.38, this one, 0.46. Meaning to say they have so many structural units no? and then in relation to the functional units. But this one, almost one is two. The other reason why they are very, very simple is that a lot of the things that they are using, they are actually offloading it into the forest. They simply bring into the forest two or three equipment. All the rest, they can construct it there in the forest. That's why it's very, very simple. So I call that equipment offloading. <coughs> Maybe I cannot discuss this anymore. This is the arrangement when you look at it and analyze it from the perspective of, from the top view, and how there are social arrangements that are repeated inside that small portion of water. Okay, here you can see uh, trampling method, Sulawesi, Borneo, Sumatra. Hand pressing method, Molokas, Melanesia, Papua New Guinea, and then the kneading apparatus. This is the same across the whole Agusan Mars area, the same kind of equipment. Quite different from the rest and very, very simple. Maybe this is a different topic. So uh, can you go to? Ju I'll just show you the pictures. Run over. Okay. Just click and click. So actually, that's all. that they are doing because they have to carry it back to their village. So they, this is specific community, they don't bring basket into the forest. They construct the basket also from the sago plant. The only thing that they, they are bringing is a kind of bolo and the what the, the sako, the adj that they uh, adj, the, the teeth of the sago. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Michael Paliga from the University of <laughs>